I guess I just assumed that once I was at school that like that was gonna be it. I was gonna have a million friends. I was gonna just party all the time and it was just gonna be lit. But it's just not really like that. Like I haven't really found anyone I'm super close with and like I spend a lot of time in my dorm room and all the people I talk to like they always say the same thing. They're like, I swear to God, you're gonna find your people. But like, where are they? This is a clip from a video made by Emery Bergman, a first year student at Cornell University in the US. She produced the video for a course she was taking in digital media in 2018, before the COVID-19 pandemic brought social and physical isolation to millions. The video went viral, racking up more than half a million views since it was uploaded. The sense of loneliness she expresses in the video is not unique. YouTube is filled with videos with titles such as I'm 23 and have no friends. I found out why I have no friends. And no friends, no family and left behind in life. According to the Office for National Statistics, 7.1% of adults in Great Britain, nearly 4 million people, say they are often or always lonely. Look around when you're in a crowded place, a supermarket or an office. One in 14 of the people you're looking at are likely to be lonely, not just sometimes, but most of the time. And that's half a million more people saying that they feel chronically lonely in 2023 than there were in 2020, suggesting that the pandemic has had some enduring impacts in this respect. The World Health Organization has recently announced a new commission on social connection to address loneliness as a pressing health threat, warning that people without strong enough social connections are at higher risk of stroke, anxiety, dementia, depression, suicide and more. Welcome to LSEIQ, the podcast where we ask social scientists and other experts to answer one intelligent question. I'm Sue Windybank from the IQ team, where we work with academics to bring you their latest research and ideas and talk to people affected by the issues we explore. In this episode, I'll be asking, how can we tackle loneliness? I'll talk to a young person who responded to her own deep feelings of loneliness by campaigning to help others. I'll hear how people can be influenced to feel more or less lonely, at least for a short time. And I'll get a surprising insight into which group of people are the loneliest. So I started to experience loneliness in September 2021 as I'd gone to university for the first time in my life. And I was 21 at this time as well. This is Molly Taylor, a 23-year-old who campaigns on loneliness as part of the Belong Collective, a network launched by UK Youth to connect youth workers and others working to address youth loneliness. She is also the founder of the Alone No More initiative. More on this later. So I was a little bit older than my cohort and my peers. So I really felt that that was already a barrier in the way. And then also joining university, I was labelled as a mature student, which again was another label, which I didn't think at the time was very big or kind of important. But now looking back at it, it's just another thing that puts a barrier in the way and can make people feel lonely. And I know that it did for me. Um, so I just thought that it was normal to feel that way. You know, Freshers Week is really scary to kind of meet loads of new people. And um, especially at 21 years old, like I hadn't been in that social situation for a while. But then I started to realise that I'd been for a lot of barriers a few months before. So for example, in early 2021, I was became estranged from my family. Not only was Molly facing the challenges of starting at university, she had also become estranged from her family earlier in the same year. However, she did not initially recognise that she might be lonely. It was a time of winter that then it started, I started to feel quite depressed. And again, that's why I thought initially it was depression and anxiety. And then when I went to the GP, because I started to see signs and think, okay, now I need intervention in this. They also just didn't know what was wrong with me. They, you know, prescribed me with other medication, which wasn't helping um, after I'd taken that for a few weeks. And I still felt the same. I was still isolating myself on purpose. Um, I was feeling really trapped in my room. I, you know, I would 
eat um, three times a day by myself, literally like speak to no one all day, every day. And there was a period of time where I didn't speak to someone verbally for about five days in one period. But this point, again, I didn't know that I was feeling lonely. Like there was no conversation around it. Again, that stigma was still there. Um, I, none of my peers knew what loneliness was and it just wasn't in a day-to-day -day conversation. I wonder as well if there's a slight stigma around loneliness, particularly for young people going to university when you're supposed to be having mm. the time of your life. Yeah. Do you think so? Yeah, I mean, growing up um, in society, we've always thought that, you know, parents and things and um, friends and older generations have always said, oh, university was the best time of my life. And this is where I've met long life friends. Um, yeah, it's been, yeah, growing up, I remember having those conversations around me, hearing a lot of my older peers talking about that and that's great that they felt that way but I think we're in such a different time period now we're in a different generation and there's so many crises outside of university that it impacts your time at university. I was taken aback that a confident young woman like Molly would say that she experienced loneliness in such a deep way. To understand more about which groups are most likely to be lonely, I spoke to David McDade, an Associate Professorial Research Fellow at LSE's Care Policy and Evaluation Centre, who works on loneliness as well as mental health issues. I must admit, when I started doing work in this area, I fell slightly into the trap of thinking this is really about people who are physically isolated, maybe older people or people with mobility issues. But that's not actually the case at all. Of course, there are lonely people in every group, but um, it's really across the age range. And actually, at the moment, in, a, in an English perspective, at least, um, there are highest rates of loneliness are actually among young people, those under the age of 25. I mean, you're pushing towards 10% of, of all young people have experienced uh, significant periods of loneliness. And what, what kind of effects might we see in these young people's lives? Apathy. Uh, withdrawal, disengagement, also in terms of the educational experience, potentially not doing as well as one would have hoped because of this, because, because they're slightly more withdrawn, potentially higher levels of depression, uh, potentially anxiety as well. well. I mean, we don't know for certain, for instance, whether it's the depression, anxiety that exacerbates loneliness or the other way around. It's probably both. Um, but those kinds of issues, it's, it's and, and, and probably also the, the loss of certainty about the future, which is an indirect, uh, it's not directly related to loneliness, but I think it, make, it makes it worse. And, and I should say, by the way, that loneliness, loneliness is not necessarily about being physically alone, okay? You can be lonely and in a crowded room of people. Is loneliness an increasing problem, or is it just something that's come to our attention more? We didn't really collect very much data on loneliness for a very long time, so I think started to really come on the radar only 20 years ago. So uh, is it increasing? I think it probably is. That may be partly about awareness as well. Um, I think it could be though partly about the changing nature of society. I mean in England there are more people living alone, um, uh, although I mean that's not the only reason to be lonely but there is that the, there's more homeworking, there's more uh, natural disengagement uh, or uh, more space between people than perhaps there was in the past. Maybe dare I say it's uh, less of a community atmosphere sometimes in some places than there was. So loneliness is on the increase and it's more than feeling a little bit isolated. Its impacts on people's lives are real. But what if someone who was lonely could be influenced to think about their situation differently so they felt less lonely? This is exactly what Heather Capes, Associate Professor of Management at LSE, explored in some of her research. I have to say, when I read your paper, it was the first time that I'd really thought about loneliness as being um, about as perhaps as much about perception as about someone's personal reality. So that was surprising to me. Can you say something about that? It is surprising and it's a bit troubling in some ways because we don't want to say like loneliness is not a real phenomenon. Just, you know, don't feel lonely. It's all in your head and you won't be because there is this fundamental human need for connections and relationships. And we know even from animal research that when those needs are not met, it's really bad for people's mental health. But 
I think our research tries to shed some light on this discrepancy between the objective levels of contact that people are getting and who develops a feeling of loneliness and who doesn't. And one of the things that we can contribute is saying a lot of it is just, you know, it's about this discrepancy between the contact you're getting and the standard you're comparing it against. And most of the research has focused on the first part, and we look at that comparison standard. So can you tell me a little bit about your research? So the source of this research was, um, I was working with a sociologist from New York University, Eric Kleinenberg, who had done a bunch of interviews with people who lived alone. And he was basically interested in aloneness and not so much the loneliness, but really like, is it um, necessary that people who live alone or spend time alone are lonely? And so I started by just reading these interviews he had. And one of the things that jumped out at me was that people were doing these kinds of what we would call in social psychology, like social comparisons, like they were saying, um, I'm better off because of this, or I'm worse off because of this, which is different from this other person. And that gave me the idea of looking at the what we would call social cognition, like the way that people are thinking about the social relationships which comes back to that issue of it's not necessarily the objective levels of contact, it's the way that people are thinking about it. So the research started by looking at these interviews and then it became a mixed methods project where we did some experiments to try to see is there a causal relationship, basically can we push around people's experience of feeling lonely for the very short term at the very mild levels Uh, by having them think about ways that they are better off or worse off either than other people or than their own lives at another point in time. Participants in Heather's research were asked to compare their own living situation with that of other people's and think about how it was either better or worse than theirs. Other participants were asked to describe ways in which their own current living situations compared to their living situation in the past. Participants were then asked to rate how lonely they were. Here's Heather explaining her findings. So we found that we basically we can um, we can push around those levels of loneliness. So we compare um, when people are people in these experiments are randomly assigned to either think about and write about a time or a couple of aspects of their life that are better or worse, and um, specifically in terms of contact with other people, because that's really what what loneliness is about, um, compared to other people or compared to a different time in their life. So when you think about how you're better off, you feel relatively less lonely. And when you think about how you're worse off, you feel more lonely. And you know, one of the interesting things we found was that it didn't seem to really matter whether people were comparing to somebody else or to their own life at another point in time. Do you have a sense whether this um, manipulation sticks over time? Yes, we do have a sense. And unfortunately, it doesn't. And that's probably as you would expect for this type of intervention, because it's really about what's changing in your head at this moment. And so if people keep doing those kinds of thoughts, you know, if they gave themselves a daily practice, as some people do a version of with like a gratitude journal of ways that my life right now is better than it was in the past, then we would expect the results to be sustained. But one of the studies, we did a follow up over seven days. And although there are immediate effects by kind of two days afterward, they're basically gone. While Heather and her co-researchers found that they could reduce people's feelings of loneliness in the short term, unfortunately, this passed quickly. However, a daily reminder of how you are more socially connected, either to a different time in your own life or in comparison to someone else, might help with feelings of isolation. You're listening to LSEIQ. If you like this podcast, you might like the LSE Events podcast, which features talks by some of the most influential figures in the social sciences. Listen to a recent talk, for example, by the Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rachel Reeves, on the women who made modern economics. For more inspiring content, search LSE Lectures and Events wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to IQ. For Molly Taylor, navigating through her first year at university and frustrated with trying to get through to mental health lines and with her GP, it was a youth worker that made all the difference. With the youth worker that I spoke to, they were just happy to give their time to me and just let me get it all out. They really just understood me and they had so much empathy for me 
and so much so that they would go outside of their working hours to you know contact me because they knew that I was unsafe in some situations and were worried about me and just cared and I think it's just it doesn't take much to tackle loneliness it just you know that's all I say is like how are you feeling that's all that it takes and just for someone to listen to you for five minutes um, of the day might be life-saving, genuinely. Molly's personal experience with loneliness has inspired her to set up an initiative called Alone No More. This includes a website with resources for young people and for organisations. So um, about a year ago, I was sitting in my bedroom and I was just going kind of getting creative and thinking if I was lonely or feeling that lonely chronically lonely again what would I what what do I think would have helped me in that moment when you know the mental health helplines fell through when there was no GP to support me when there was no friend or family and I kind of come up with the idea of a loneliness postcard project so it's like a postcard and um, on the kind of back end of it there are kind of designs that you can colour in so similar to those mental health colouring books um, with positive affirmations and then on the um, front side of it there would be like a journal prompt for loneliness so for example think about the time when you felt a sense of community um, what network of support do you have um, what do you feel when you feel loneliness so you can then spot the signs Molly partners with organisations which use the postcards in workshops, for example. And since August, 7,000 young people have accessed the resources available through Alone No More. And Molly has established more than 10 partnerships across the UK. Of course, older people also experience loneliness and isolation. And getting them involved in social activities is part of a cross-governmental strategy to address loneliness in England. David McDade evaluated one such scheme called Reconnections in Worcestershire in the UK. The programme was set up for people over the age of 55 who met a criteria for being lonely. They were then matched with a volunteer who worked with them to identify an activity that the person enjoyed doing. I remember one gentleman who wanted to go gliding, or he had been gliding, that's right, he used to be a pilot. And he was able to get involved with uh, an engineering society and do sort of car mechanics works and so forth because he'd reached a stage in life where even though he loved doing the gliding, it was a little bit challenging. But he was trying to find things that work for people. Um, uh, so it could be all sorts of mainly social engagement. Some of the people who were identified as being participants of the programme ended up delivering the programme to others. And, and I would say as a general rule of thumb, that approach has worked for, for many people, not everyone, but for many people. People did create new friendships. They they, they felt more communi- uh, more um, connected to their communities. Some cases le- less isolated and more intergenerational connections. Many of the volunteers were actually younger people, um, students and, uh, and 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 others. And certainly the people we talked to, um, a number of them really talked about the benefits of having that intergenerational c- talking to younger people, basically and having that connection. Were there any um, kind of shortcomings? I would say that some people perhaps ended up doing things that weren't their first choice. You know, they rather would have done something else. The point I mentioned about more intergenerational rather than mono-generational, if that's a word, um, uh, group activity. So there were things like that. Uh, And I also think the other thing that was actually actually a very important point, I've just remembered it now, but it is important, Many of the social connection activities appeal less to men than they do to women, perhaps. The, 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 the coffee mornings, the social outings, the shopping trips and, and the, the work shopping trips and so forth. So there is that challenge as well about how do you engage with um, men uh, who, again, you know, don't want to necessarily talk about things like loneliness or touchy-feely stuff, but in a way that works. That is a challenge going forward. David also highlights the challenge of making sure activities appeal to people from diverse backgrounds. In 2015, he worked on a report on mental well-being for the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, also known as NICE. One of the things that the NICE report said was uh, participate in community choirs. Because community choirs were associated with a reduction in loneliness, but, and this is the but, um, the evaluations tended to be mainly about women and mainly uh, about white women of a certain age 
who knew many of the who know many of the traditional songs um you know keep the home fires burning it's a long way to Tipperary and other things um and 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 maybe that doesn't necessarily appeal to everyone of you know and so forth so all to men actually for that matter when i say that's these things so so there are those kinds of issues there uh, and, and and i know lots of work is going on uh, to try and challenge like gardening projects um uh walking schemes cinema projects all sorts of things but but it but that's also why it can be a bit challenging because these are very individualistic types of activity you know it's not it's we can't have some monolithical program that says you know this is everyone's going to go and do tai chi um uh, you know and uh, or, or whatever as david says not everyone wants to go to a coffee morning or do tai chi but it's the human connection that matters going back to where we started how can we tackle loneliness here's heather cappers I don't know whether we always know yet what the solution is, but at least we're trying. And maybe that goes some way toward destigmatizing the problem, because I think one of the things that probably contributes to higher levels of loneliness is kind of feeling like it isolates you. Like, I must be the only one. Everybody else is out with friends and and having people who care about them. So being able to talk about it, being able to share strategies, I think being able to study it um, hopefully helps us figure out ways that we can can uh, can tackle it. Um, yeah, I guess I, if I would take my researcher hat off and just put on my uh, citizen hat, I would say things like you know trying to bring people together, building community organizations, get involved. For Heather, reducing the stigma around loneliness is key. David McDade explains it's not always about tackling loneliness directly. Some other research I was involved with was looking at the experiences of people with lived experiences of poor mental health who also were lonely. And the reasons that some of those people said that they were lonely uh, was uh, were about factors that are very much amenable to, 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 to remedy. But basically things like poverty, inequality, uh, financial exclusion, uh, that were exacerbating things. The loss of family connection, maybe people move from one part of the country to the other and so forth. Or, or you, People who become carers because a parent is unwell and then they lose contact with people. So so the point is there are multiple, multiple reasons that um, that can be the trigger for significant subst- sustained periods of loneliness. So understanding those reasons is important. And then really, I think going back to the reconnections project and similar things, trying to identify, helping people to help themselves to identify what might be the ways to try and just move a little bit out of that feeling of being lonely all the time or for a lot of the time. And you know, you're not going to change everyone's life overnight, but if you can reduce the way, reduce levels of loneliness a little bit for people, that makes a difference. I mean, there are that will help with mental health. It'll help with other things as well. Building connections will help. Trying to think about ways to stop people becoming detached from society. I, I, I think the, I think that it's that human connection, whether it's the phone, whether it's the face to face. I think they are incredibly important things. The online anonymous platform, if needs be. Um, so I, I don't think this is high tech. I don't think it's necessarily an expensive thing to do, but I think it's about cultural change. For David, tackling loneliness is also about making the case to policymakers to fund interventions to help deal with loneliness. This means that researchers need to show how loneliness impacts on what's known as the Quality Adjusted Life Year, or QALYS. This is technical, but important, because this measures how well different medical treatments lengthen or improve patients' lives and it helps determine whether or not a treatment gets approved as offering good value for money for the NHS. When we're evaluating or deciding how to spend money on health-related interventions, one of the the key measure that's used, the thing we look at so we can compare lots of things, is something called the Quality Adjusted Life Year or Quality of Life. Okay, so NICE, I mentioned earlier, this guidance body in England that recommends what services and supports that are available through the health system, including public health. Um, they, 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 they look really at, you know, how many qualities are gained. If we can understand the impact of loneliness directly on quality of life, then we can argue that if an intervention tackles loneliness or prevents loneliness and therefore improves quality of life, that can then be compared 
by healthcare funders and public health authorities with other things that they might consider doing with the often limited resources they have. So, and, and at the moment, that's one of the things that is missing. So we can say, yes, this is reducing loneliness, but it's actually then translating that into something that policymakers who aren't always necessarily interested in loneliness will find useful or find helpful when they're thinking about what to do with their resource. It's anarchy, but it's important. I asked Molly the same question. How can we tackle loneliness? I ran an event last year um, on Lonely Not Alone Day, um, which was led by the Carp Foundation at my university. Showed some postcards, you know, set up a table with research to suggest like um, kind of things about loneliness and what you can do to tackle it. And I really wasn't expecting any student to come up to me because it's such a, again, this stigmatised conversation. But actually, on that day, 50 young people came up to me and I was quite surprised and everyone that came up to me said that they'd felt lonely at some point. So I think just as simple as raising awareness, you know, putting some posters up around university halls, um, kind of having an ambassador that can, um, or a volunteer team that can run similar events is great. And I think just general society, let's just talk about it more. You know, if you're listening to this and you're not a student or a young person, but you may perhaps a different age or a different group of people, um, just ask, it all still applies to us, just asking someone how they are. This episode was produced by me with help from Sophie Mallet and Matt Mundy and edited by Oliver Johnson. If you'd like to find out more about the research in the episode, please head to the show notes. If you enjoy LSEIQ, please leave us a review. Next month, we'll be taking a break, but we'll be back in February with more IQ.